Bibles this morning. Open them up to Matthew chapter 12, please. Matthew chapter 12, and uh, we'll begin reading in verse 1. Matthew chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him? He said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. One of my favorite episodes of the Andy Griffith show is the one entitled Citizen's Arrest. And if you've seen that episode, you know some of the characters that are involved. Barney sees Gomer making a U-turn, pulls him over because of it, and says, you've made an illegal U-turn. Gomer says, but I'm technically an emergency operating vehicle, so I, I have an exemption from this. And Barney asks him, were you operating in emergency capacity? Gomer says no, and Gomer tries his best to get out of it. He says, well, you and me are friends, Barney. You're not going to write me a ticket, are you? And Barney says, because you broke the law, I cannot show partiality. He says, if my own mother made a U-turn, I would write her a ticket too. And you are also able to give a ticket, Gomer. You can do it in what's called a citizen's arrest because no one person is above the law. So Barney gets in his car, Gomer huffs off, and Barney makes another U-turn back to the courthouse. And Gomer gets out of his truck yelling out, citizen's arrest, citizen's arrest. And there's a big scene that goes back between Gomer and Barney, and Andy makes Barney write himself a ticket, and that's the, the, the entire rest of the episode. But I think what, what Barney often demonstrates in that episode and in other episodes is kind of what Jesus gets at with the Pharisees. You can be so concerned with the letter of the law that you forget about the spirit of the law. You can be so focused on the form of the law that you completely miss out on its intent. And this is what Jesus says to the Pharisees who are gathered around. Uh, apparently something ha has happened. The disciples have, on the Sabbath day while traveling through, they've plucked some grain and, and they've begun to eat. And you remember there were Old Testament laws that actually allowed for this practice. The Jewish people were required to, to leave some grain on the road so that those who traveled by, the, the foreigners, the strangers, the widows, and the orphans might have something to eat. And a few hundred years earlier, that's how Ruth had met Boaz. And this is exactly what the disciples are doing, and it's not that they're plucking the grain, it's that they're doing it on the Sabbath day. But a lot of what Jesus says makes the Pharisees mad because he exposes their self-righteous ways. And this is no different. These religious leaders attempt to trap Jesus. They think they're doing God's bidding, but in fact, they're actually opposing God. Very easy to think you're doing the will of God when you're actually obstructing his will. Paul knew about that before he became a believer. And we know that in the scripture, Sabbath rest is very important. God sets that pattern for us even from the beginning. So on the seventh day, he, he rests not because he is tired, but because he desires to set an example to us of what rest and what holiness looks like. So much so that Moses, when he is given those commandments by God, the fourth one reads, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This day is set aside as a day of holiness before him. Now, now rest assured 
Sabbath rest was mandatory in Scripture. But what the Pharisees had done was set a massive set of extras to the Sabbath law so that people wouldn't violate it. And in the process, they go after the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. They go after its form rather than its intent. You know, how we do things is not nearly as important as why we do things. You think about that for a second. Sometimes we get very caught up in how we're going to accomplish a task or how we're going to get through a given day or a given circumstance, and we often fail to examine the very purpose for which we do it in the first place, the why. And the Pharisees here have spent so much time focusing and working out how they can keep the Sabbath day that they've forgotten about why they keep it in the first place. So much so that Jesus says to them in another recounting of this passage in Mark 2, don't you realize that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath? You're so focused on what you're doing or how you're doing it that you've forgotten why you're doing it. How easy it is to focus on the how and to completely forget about the why. To focus on going to worship rather than why you worship. To focus on being obligated to serve rather than why you serve. To focus on having to share the gospel rather than why you share the gospel. The Pharisees have gotten themselves in a trap here. They're caught up in expanding the law of Moses, Jesus says, but someone greater than Moses is here. They're obsessed with surpassing the wisdom of Solomon, but someone greater than Solomon has arrived. And by choking out the intent of the Sabbath, they are missing the entire purpose of the Sabbath, of the rest that Jesus offers in Matthew chapter 11, which is communion with God. They know about God. They know what God asks. But they don't know God. And then he uses examples from the Old Testament to prove his point. The Old Testament in which the Pharisees were supposed to be well versed. So he says, do you not remember David eating this bread of the presence? Those 12 loaves that would have been baked each Sabbath to remember God's covenant. And God did not consider him guilty because of it. He says, have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temples profane the Sabbath? They violate these laws themselves and yet they're guiltless. He says, beyond that, something greater than the temple is here. Something greater than the synagogue has arrived. And then Jesus gets to the heart of the matter, as he so often does. He says, you would have known this. What this truly means, that I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. See, God has given His people Sabbath rest in order to relieve their burdens, not so that observing the Sabbath would become a burden. He who never slumbers nor sleeps does so that you may find rest. And a big part of Sabbath rest is to remind us that our work is not nearly as important as God's working in us. See, some of you this morning are so busy... You are so focused on work. You are so focused on your calendar and doing all your events and getting your kids and grandkids to wherever they have to be that you completely miss out on the rest that God offers you in Christ. That's the whole reason we're gathered here to remind us of who we are in Him. That we are a people in desperate need of God and when you fill your schedule with activities and events And things that you have to attend, rather than entering into the rest that God offers you, you miss out on the very reason you're here in the first place. Some of you are on the opposite end of this. You're so lazy that you don't do the work that God requires you to do, and so when you're supposed to take a Sabbath rest, you're not able to because you're catching up on the stuff that you were supposed to do the entire week. God will not honor laziness. And so he says, on the one end, you may be working too much, and on the other end, you may be working too little, but on either end, you're missing out on what God offers you in Christ, this rest that remains for the people of God. And then he tells us the whole reason why he says what he says. 
Because the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That is the very person who wrote the law is now here to fulfill it. And he asked them some, some questions. He says, look, which of you, if your sheep is in the pit, will you not rescue them from the pit, even if it's a Sabbath day? Reminds us what God says in Psalm 40. David writes that he brought me up out of the miry pit, out of that clay, and set me up upon a rock. He broke that curse of sin on my behalf. And then Jesus says, of how much more value is a man than a sheep? In our culture, maybe not a whole lot. We tend to value animals a lot more than we do human life. He says, so it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And in fact... For you not to do good on the Sabbath is a violation of the very law that God has put in place for the one who knows to do good and does it not, James tells us. To him it is sin. So what do we do with this law if Jesus himself is comfortable with the disciples breaking this law? What's the purpose? What's the intent? Well, we know that Jesus did not come to destroy that law, but in fact, he came to fulfill it. This law is not given as a curse, but as a blessing. It's meant for our protection, for our good and our joy. Listen, we ought to delight in the law of the Lord. He doesn't give it to us as burdensome. His commandments are not meant to be that way. But when you start measuring the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law, you've missed the whole point of the law. Some of you folks who are older, do you remember blue laws? I remember blue laws, what those are. Blue laws were meant to keep stores and restaurants from being open on Sunday so that people would go to church. And in a lot of places around the United States, blue laws are actually still in existence. They're not observed, but they're, they're still there along with some other things. But the whole purpose of blue laws was to, to keep the businesses open so that people would go to church. I think sometimes the church misses out, though. We tell people they ought to be in church on Sunday mornings, and they ought not to be doing all of these other things, but we forget to tell them why they should come. We forget to tell them the joy that comes in God. We forget to tell them that if they knew of the relationship with God that He offers them in Christ, they would not want to do these other things. And even if you keep all of the laws in the book, even if you are righteous like the Pharisees, keeping all of the laws in the world is not enough to take away your sin. Because underscoring the law of God is the mercy of God. Listen, the law is not given for us in order to be saved, but because we are saved. We don't have to serve God because we have to, but because we want to. Because our affections have been set on the things above and not on the things of the earth. I remember as a 10-year-old boy, my parents raised me to be in church, you know, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night. But I, I was so legalistic even as a, as a 10-year-old. I thought that if I missed a service, um, God was going to condemn me for it. And I remember one particular night when we didn't quite make it to church on time. We weren't ready to leave, and so we, we didn't go that night. I, I spent probably a half hour in torture over that and in tears and you know, condemning my parents for not taking me to church because I thought that ultimately if I missed, it would send me to hell. I wasn't serving God out of delight. I was serving Him out of duty. And I wonder today how many of us have that same mentality. Maybe we're not as outspoken about it. Maybe we would never say that kind of thing out loud. But how many of us serve God out of obligation rather than out of freedom. See, when you try to pull back these Sabbath laws and when you try to hold them into place to where they're a burden for you, you're in the same place where the Israelites were. They knew what slavery looked like. They had been in Egypt. God wrote these laws for them so they might have freedom. Serving Him. He says, look, Christ has set you free. You're no longer under the law of slavery, but the law of liberty. And this greatest commandment for you is the law of love. And so if I want to follow the law, the question that I need to ask is, what is the most loving thing I can do for this person? It's unkind not to speak the truth to someone. It's harsh not to back up that truth with love. 
He says, you have got to start looking, stop looking at the law as restriction on what you can and cannot do and start looking at the laws of God as the greatest freedom and the greatest protection you will ever know. Somebody did an opposite of the Ten Commandments one day. Instead of saying, thou shalt not, they switched it around. And it was saying things like, thou shalt sense the goodness of the Lord because of honoring Him. Thou shalt rest in the Sabbath day and be refreshed in the relation that comes from knowing God. If we turn those things around and thought of them differently. And then Jesus plays this out in a different scene. Look with me, beginning in verse 9. This man with a withered hand. He goes on from there, goes into the synagogue. This may have been a different Sabbath day, we're not sure. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So they're trying to accuse him and they're trying to trap him again. Jesus asked all of these questions. Which of you has a sheep? If it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will it not take hold and bring it out? How much more value is a man than a sheep? So it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he says to this man, stretch forth your hand. And he stretches it and he's healed. Now you have to understand, to have paralysis, to be lame, to have a disease, to have leprosy, whatever disease or skin issue you had, was considered to be a a condemnation at large in the culture of Israel. So this man with this withered hand is probably looked at as being judged by God. Well, he's not living right. That's the reason the problems came his way. That's probably the way a lot of people look at him. And yet Jesus doesn't do such a thing. He doesn't wait till the next day. He says, it is lawful to do good. This man who's probably been condemned by the rest of society, Jesus says, I'll heal him and I'll do it right here in the synagogue and it's going to make the Pharisees mad. I wonder sometimes if that isn't exactly what the church is supposed to be about. We pray a lot of things. We pray for body parts. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for different things and it's important. But but when do we really pray, Lord, give us the people that society has condemned. Give us those who are outcasts. Give us the people that no one else wants and let them know and sense the love of Christ. Give us those who are broken. Give us those who are in desperate need of you and know they need it. And then let them know the love of Christ. And these Pharisees, rather than celebrating at the work of God, They go out and conspire against him how to destroy him. This miracle takes place and they plot murder in response. You know, I don't know about you, but if I saw Jesus heal someone, I would hope that I would respond in celebration. Look what God has done. But you know, many times as the church, we see God working and doing great things and we just sit there. We don't celebrate God working among us. And he says, you better be a people who are willing to celebrate the working of God or else God will move his working elsewhere. Undergirding all of this law is the mercy of God. And if we understood his mercy, if we understood what he had given us, that he hasn't given us what we deserve, that he hasn't given us what is truly fitting, but he's given us freely of his grace. We change our attitudes. I've gotten two speeding tickets in my life. This is confession time. I don't know if if they were really deserved. I do know I was over the limit, and so legally I was bound. I've gotten two speeding tickets, and I've never had to pay for either of them. My uh, first ticket I got when I was 22, I was traveling with my pastor to to Louisville. We were going to help move his, his sister from an apartment, And, you know, when you get right outside of the the Snyder, exit 125, right where that zone changes, you go from 75 to 55, just just in a block of about a half mile. I I didn't see that coming, and my pastor was always encouraging me to go quickly. I was in the the left-hand lane. I remember this unmarked car pulling us over. And my pastor grabbed the ticket from me. I, I said, Pastor, that's my ticket. He said, I don't want your parents to find out about it while you were going with me. And as, as far as I understood, I never saw that ticket again, and I guess he covered it. And I don't think mom and dad know until this day unless they watch this video later on. So we got that covered pretty well. The other one 
was one I tried to cover up on my own behalf. I'd just gotten out of a class all day long at Southern Seminary. I was trying to finish my, my first master's, Master Divinity. I was taking 18 hours that last semester. That Nine hours is a full load in graduate school. I was taking 18, mainly because I was an idiot, and I thought I could get out in, in three years, and you know, I, I don't know how that helped me. But anyway, I, I did that, and it was exhausting late at night. I was going back to LaRue County, Kentucky, and wasn't paying attention to how fast I was going. Got pulled over again. Tried to explain to the officer everything that had gone on during the day. That didn't go anywhere. So I shook his hand and thanked him and thought, well, I'll try to cover this. I'm just glad it was in the middle of the night so nobody in the county would see. Because a small county, you know how it is. Everybody knows everything. I got a call the next day from the clerk's office. Forgot that I had a member that worked there. <laughs> she said, did you get a ticket last night? I said, well, it depends on whose name is on it. She said, it looks an awful lot like yours. And she said, take this to the courthouse and go before the attorney and it'll be covered. And, and I did that exact same thing, went before the, the LaRue County attorney had, had mercy on me that day after giving me a pretty good speech about why I shouldn't be speeding regardless of what time of night it was. You know, in both of those situations, I, I was guilty. I deserved the punishment. There was no way for me to argue my way out. I could talk about all of the excuses, but by the standards of the law, I was out of it. The truth is, you and I are also guilty before God. Oh, maybe we're not accused of all the accusations that the Pharisees made, but we've broken the law. There's been times when we haven't honored God, and no one seeks first His kingdom and His righteousness every moment of every day. But God, in His mercy looking beyond the capacities of the law, sends His Son, Jesus Christ, who paid a debt He didn't know because you and I owed a debt we couldn't pay. And on the cross, all of the law-breaking that you and I committed was experienced in the suffering of Jesus Christ. And when you begin to understand what Christ has done on our behalf, how He has freed you, how He has taken your debt and taken your penalty and taken your punishment and given you pardon, then when you begin to serve the Lord, you'll no longer do it out of obligation. You won't do it out of duty, but you'll do it out of delight because your heart rests in the things of God. And He calls you today to enter into that Sabbath rest and to lay your burden down because the Lord of the Sabbath is Lord over you. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the sermon video today. If you found it helpful, would you consider sharing it with a family member or a friend? That would help us to spread this ministry and get the gospel to the ends of the earth. You can also find more information on our website, barryefields.com. Again, thanks for watching.